the psychometric chart. We spend a lot of time as engineers using this tool, this device, which discusses the properties of air and the water in the air. And we use it to figure out how to condition that air, whether it's heating, cooling, humidifying, dehumidifying. This chart comes from many, many hundreds of thousands of points of data that are collected in the field to generate this chart. And it all has to do with how much air is in the water and how we go from one temperature of air or one humidification point of air to another. So let's talk about the chart. You should all have a handy dandy Inspire psychometric chart in your hands. Let's talk about some of the different axes. So this is our chart. Along the bottom, you're going to find the dry bulb temperature. Dry bulb temperature. You're going to find the wet bulb temperature in a diagonal from the bottom right-hand corner of the chart to the top left-hand corner of the chart in green lines. You're going to find the dew point temperature as an axis here along the y-axis of the chart on the right-hand side. You're going to find relative humidity as swooping lines starting from 100, which is the very top of this chart, along this swooping line to 0% relative humidity along this flat line. And the swooping lines that are connected in between are all the relative humidity lines. And then the last thing you find is the humidity ratio. So the humidity ratio also runs along this axis here. It's this axis right here is the humidity ratio. It deals with the amount of water in air per pound of air itself. All right, let's talk about what all these, what all these different terms mean. A dry bulb thermometer is the thermometer you might be used to when someone took your temperature as a kid. This is a thermometer that when waved around in the air, it is dry on the outside. This bulb right here is dry, and it is measuring what we call the sensible energy of the air. It is the dry bulb temperature of the air. Anytime you want to use this chart, you could use one of these thermometers to measure the air you're trying to put on the chart. Wave it around in that air, and it'll tell you where you should be along this axis. The next couple of tools will help us figure out how far up we go on this axis to find our place on the chart. So we've had dry bulb, now we have a wet bulb thermometer. Very similar device. In fact, it's the exact same device except there is a sock at the end of it that is soaking wet. Okay, why do we do that? Well, the wet bulb thermometer is going to find another point on this chart, and it's going to tell us the rate at which the water is evaporating off of the sock, and in doing so, bring down the temperature of the bulb, which is encased in that wet sock. So, I want to find out the wet bulb temperature of some air I need to measure. I'm going to take this wet sock, sling it around inside my room that I'm trying to measure, and the temperature I read on this chart will give us the second point along the wet bulb lines, and between the two points, I now know where we are on the chart. Is that because of the evaporative cooling effect of water? That is because of the evaporative cooling effect of water. The same reason that we sweat when we get hot, the same reason that plants transpire when they're exposed to radiation. Okay? So let's talk about why the dew point's relevant. We have this dew point on the chart right here. This is something you'll see every day on the nightly news. They'll talk about the dew point temperature as we go into our overnight condition. What they're really concerned about is if the temperature of the air gets below this number that we call the dew point, we are going to have condensation come out of the air and onto the surface that is at or below that dew point. So, let me repeat that. The dew point is the temperature at which condensation will occur. So if I take a can of Coke out of a fridge and it's below the dew point of the air that we've plotted using our dry bulb and wet bulb thermometers, that can of Coke being below the dew point will condense moisture on its surface. This is the principle by which most mechanical cooling is done and most mechanical dehumidification is done. Yes, question. What's the difference between dew point and absolute humidity? Great question. Dew point is a measure of absolute humidity. Any line that goes directly up and down here, any axis that is on the y-axis of this chart, is a measure or a reference for absolute humidity. But one of the things you should note is that it is a 
it is a useful tool rather than an absolute measure of a physical property. So for example, and I probably didn't word that right, but I'll get it right next time. So as an example, we're about to talk about the humidity ratio, which is an actual measurement of the amount of water in the air. If we could collect it all inside of a pound of air, which takes up about 13 cubic square feet, if we take all the water in that and measure it out, and plot whatever point we're at on that humidity ratio, we'll find out exactly how many grains of water, which are, of which there are 7,000 in a pound, we'll find out how many grains of water are inside that 13 cubic feet of air. It's an absolute measure of a physical quantity. Okay, so dew occurs when surfaces reach the dew point temperature outside. Fog occurs when the air is saturated. So if we happen to hit that magical condition in Santa Cruz all summer long when the temperature is 60 degrees Fahrenheit and the air coming in off the ocean has been cooled down to 60 degrees, the moisture being at 100% as it's picked up all that water off the ocean rolls in as fog. So fog is air which is saturated with water and can no longer hold any more water. If I tried to mist water into it, that water would beat up, form raindrops, and fall out. So that one other measure we want to talk about is the relative humidity. So let's talk about what relative humidity is. We see these swooping lines. This bottom one here is zero, and then they start swooping up from zero all the way to 100. It's very important to note that the relative humidity is the amount of moisture that's in a given amount of air over the amount of moisture that the given amount of air can hold. It is not a measure of how much of the air is water. If you take a look at the humidity ratio, which we'll describe shortly, you'll find out very quickly that at 100% relative humidity, we're not talking more than a percent or two of actual water molecules versus the rest of the air molecules around it. So 100% relative humidity is only one or two percent of water in the air. Does everyone follow that? 100% relative humidity is a measure of the humidity carrying, the water carrying capacity of air, not of the amount of water that makes up the air. Okay? Good. So if I have a given volume of air and I put in 50% of what it can hold, I have 50% relative humidity. If I have saturated air, if I go into a cloud and take a measure of how much water is in that volume of air, I will find that I could not put any more water into that air. This is what clouds are, this is what fog is, this is what a misting system creates. It creates 100% relative humidity. So now let's talk about the humidity ratio. So let's say I was gonna take that volume of air, which was at 50 or 100% relative humidity, and squeeze out the cloud, squeeze out all the water from that particular volume, and then weigh the water versus the weight of the air. The humidity ratio is a weight divided by a weight. The humidity ratio is grains, which is a unit of measure for weight, grains of water divided by pounds of water. It is grains per pound grains of water per pound of air. Does everyone follow? There's other numbers that exist for this as well. Anytime you see humidity ratio, you can expect it to be a mass over a mass or a weight over a weight. So you may have grams per kilogram, you may have pounds per pound, and when you go pounds per pound, well, you've got very, very, very small numbers. So the humidity ratio that we work with, which is grains divided by pounds, just happens to give us numbers that are in our tangible reach. They're not five, six decimal places. Um, they're not in the hundreds or thousands or millions. Um, they just exist in a very small number that is useful for us to use. Okay, we've talked about this entire chart. You know everything there is to know about finding your way around this chart. Except to say that things change. Air changes, temperature changes, humidities change. So let's talk a little bit about what we can do with this information to figure out where we're going to go and apply it in our grow rooms. 
let's start by finding our way onto a specific point on the chart. So let's say we've got our dry bulb thermometer and we've got our wet bulb thermometer. We go outside on a hot, humid day in Atlanta, because it's definitely not here. We measure 95 degrees Fahrenheit dry bulb and we measure 78 degrees Fahrenheit wet bulb. So take a moment to look at your psychometric charts and let's play plot the point. So on the x-axis down here, you're going to find 95 degrees Fahrenheit, between 90 and 100, obviously. And then you're going to look at the wet bulb lines, and you're going to take the 95 degree Fahrenheit line all the way up until it crosses through the 78 degree Fahrenheit wet bulb line. And you should put with your pen a little dot there, and that's where we are. Now, what else do we know about this point? <clears throat> Butzal, tell me, what is the relative humidity at this point? Okay, so 95 degrees Fahrenheit. It's uh, 48. 95 degrees Fahrenheit and 78 degrees wet bulb. Jesse, what do you have? Okay, so along the x-axis on the bottom of this chart, yep, go to 95 degrees. Straight up, and then... Now look at the green lines, yep. which are the wet bulb temperature that run in this direction. Got it. Okay, now find the one that's at 78, so 75, 76, 77, 78. Okay, now yep. draw it over until those two points meet, 95 and 78. Okay. And put a circle there, put a dot. Tell me, Jesse, what relative humidity are we at? We're, hold on. So the way to find this out this is, is by starting at the bottom and saying, this is 0% relative humidity. Sure. 10 is the next line up. 20, 30, 40, right. 50. Right, Where are we? Below 50. Just below 50? Yeah. We're at about 48% relative humidity. Okay, great. Okay? Great. Brian, you got it? Confirmed. Audit. Brian, Audit. without looking at the board, don't look, look down. Aye, aye, Captain. What is the dew point at this condition? Remembering, the dew point is along the right side of your chart. And it's one of the axes that goes straight up and down the right side of your chart. About 72. 72? Who agrees with that? Batsal, do you agree with that? No. No. What do you say, Batsal? 74. Okay. Jesse, what do you say? Um, I'm with Brian, 72. 72. Okay, we have a consensus. We have a quorum. 72. 72. 72. That's right. Perfect. There you go. Ladies and gentlemen, we found it. So to reiterate, at 72 degrees, if we take the same condition air and drop it to 72 degrees, anything below that, water will start condensing out of the air. That's correct. To, if we took any surface also that's below 72 degrees into 95 degree air at 48% relative humidity, water is going to condense on anything 72 degrees and below, right? As the air hits that surface, the air gets closer and closer to the temperature of the thing that is 72 degrees or less, yeah. and that is where moisture will condense. Yeah. What happens at night when the temperature drops? So at night when the temperature drops, what happens most often when we find dew on our cars is that the radiative effect of losing all the energy out into space cools the surfaces on the ground, including your metallic surfaces on your car. 
So the dew on your car is because the surface of the car got below the dew point of the air. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, great. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so where did this chart come from, right? Like who's like, okay, we need a chart that looks like this because this will be easy to work with. All right. One of the places you can start is not at air with zero water in it. Water is molecules, and getting rid of molecules is actually a challenge. But what we can do is make saturated air very easily. I can spray moisture into the air and come up with a saturated condition at almost any temperature. I spray water inside of a box, and I slowly heat the box up until it gets to whatever temperature I want to measure it at. And then I can take a look at the amount of water inside that box and say, okay, this box at this temperature holds this much moisture. So they did this for a number of different temperatures of air. And they came up with a humidity ratio which said, for every pound of air that I got inside this box, I ended up with 19.4 grains per pound of moisture at full saturated conditions. At 40 degrees, at 55. And you'll notice as the temperatures go up, it's not a five degree increase, five degree, or five grains per pound increase. It starts there, it doesn't end there. So what happens when we take these points and put them on a chart? And that chart is temperature in one direction and grains per pound of moisture in the y direction. I start here, I say, this is my humidity ratio. I have no moisture in the air at this point. I have 20, 40, 60, it's just an arbitrary scale of grains per pound of moisture on the left side. And then I say, this is my temperature, 25 to 110 degrees Fahrenheit in the X direction. So I wanna, these are 100% saturated air conditions. If I plot them, they look like this. So what? Well, this is our 100% relative humidity curve. They start with this line because it's very easy to generate those conditions experimentally, right? If you don't know where you are, if you don't know where you are on the psychometric chart, when you go to do an experiment and set up a chart like this, you have to go in one direction or the other. You could take all the water out, you could put all the water you know you can in by constantly misting the air. That's what they did here, and that's how they discovered this 100% relative humidity line curve. From there, it's pretty easy. From there, I take the distance from here to here at any one point, from the curve to zero, along this line, and I divide it into tenths. And this is where I get my relative humidity curves. So my relative humidity curves on this chart if I go in, a, it looks like they're all very curved. But if I go in a straight line down, there is an equal distance between each temperature line crossing the relative humidity curves. Does that follow? So this is where we get the term relative humidity from. It is a fraction of the humidity of the air relative to the total amount of air, uh, total amount of moisture the air can hold. When I get to 100% conditions, I know that I can no longer hold any more water in the air. It is saturated. Okay. So what does it have to do with dry ball, wet ball, dew point, relative humidity? We can have the exact same amount of moisture inside the air at a number of different conditions. What changes when we go to map these points? Well, in this case, the only absolute measure of moisture in the air is the dew point. Everything else will change as we move along this line. So at saturated conditions, let's say we're at 60 degrees Fahrenheit, right here we're at a 60 degree dew point. Our wet bulb temperature, if you look on your chart, is also 60 degrees. I'm swinging around a wet sock in the air, hoping it'll cool off the bulb through the evaporative cooling effect. But 
I have all the moisture in the air that the air can handle. There's no water coming off the bulb. The temperature of the air sensibly is the temperature of the air from a latent or moisture-laden perspective. So 100% saturation gives us the dry bulb temperature, the wet bulb temperature, and the dew point temperature. Let's say I want to take a box of air at these conditions, and I'm not going to add any water to it. I'm going to take the box, it's already got all the water it has in it, it's saturated. And I start to heat up the box, okay? And I let it expand, we're in a balloon, I let it expand. As I start to move away, I'm not adding water energy, I'm adding temperature energy, I'm adding the heat, uh, sensible heat energy. I'm going to start moving along this line. I haven't added any absolute more moisture into my balloon. So instead, we keep the amount of water in that volume constant. We increase the dry bulb temperature from 60 to 62. Well now, if I swung my wet bulb thermometer in there, it's going to be some temperature less than, uh, less than 62 degrees, right? So. 62 degrees is a dry bulb. I put it in a wet sock, and now I'm spinning it around. Instead of being 62 degrees, it's gonna come down from 62 because some of that water can evaporate off the sock. The bulb gets cooler, and now we're at 60.8 wet bulb. The dew point, still 60. But where are we on the relative humidity curve? We're no longer at saturation conditions. We're at 92% relative humidity. Okay, we're moving along the line. We heat up the air even more. We get to 75 degrees Fahrenheit dry bulb. 75 degrees Fahrenheit dry bulb equates to 65.2 on the wet bulb scale, but we're still at 60 degrees on the dew point. The dew point hasn't changed. We have no more or less moisture going into our volume of air. All we've done is heat it with sensible energy. So now the temperature goes up, we go to 75 degrees, the wet bulb has changed because now if I slung a wet sock inside of it, it would cool the bulb off significantly from 75 degrees. A relative humidity line, we're only 60% of the way of the curve. Right? This water, the, sorry, this, this volume of air at this condition could hold a lot more water now that we've added temperature energy to it. And then finally, our last point. We get to 90 degrees Fahrenheit, the wet bulb is 70, the dew point 60, and well, from a relative humidity perspective, we're only 37% of the way up this theoretical line until we hit the saturation point. But this line continued all the way up. We go pretty far up off the television. Okay. It's pretty exponential, really. Quite. Quite. So let's talk about what happens when we add sensible heat. We start at a condition that's saturation. We're adding sensible only heat, which is temperature only, uh, temperature based heat. It has nothing to do with moisture addition into the space. This is in a grow room. What happens when we turn the lights on and there are no plants in the room, no people in the room? It is a dry box with hot electric toasters that make light. This is sensible addition of heat. These relative humidity curves, like I said before, they indicate as we go up in a very exponential way how much water the air could hold at saturation and any place on here how much more water it could hold if we wanted to get there. The properties of air are such that this humidity ratio here also could be referred to as the dew point matches a dry bulb and matches a relative humidity. We can use any one of these points to find our way around this chart. Earlier today we talked about, well I don't really have the conditions for the room, all I have is dry bulb and wet bulb. We have a number of different ways to play on this chart to figure out exactly which way we can go, exactly, exactly where we'll find ourselves on the chart. So people need to understand that humidity ratios, dew points, relative humidities, wet bulbs, and dry bulb temperatures, we only need two out of the seven or eight different ways that we measure air's properties to find our way onto the chart. Moving on, okay. We've talked about dry bulb. We've talked about wet bulb. We've talked about dew point. Absolute humidity numbers. 
from relative humidity numbers, right? Wet bulbs, dry bulbs, dew points, also humidity ratio, okay? These are the properties of air. There's one more we need to talk about, which is, as you heat air up, it occupies more cubic feet per pound. So, if I took air, and I'm moving air through a fan at a certain temperature, and then I cool that air down, and I want to move the exact same volume of air through a fan, I'm going to be moving heavier air relative to, respective to the volume if I change the temperature in one direction or another. So keep that in mind. The other thing you'll find on these lines are specific volume, cubic feet of air for every pound of air that you want to move. Okay? And this comes into play when we start talking about the we start talking about moving air around, the fan laws, fan energy, and actually what we're really talking about is how much moisture we can fit into air at higher and higher temperatures. You'll notice that as we move along this line here, the cubic feet increases. That expansion means there is more room in a pound of air that needs to get taken up as the molecules push each other apart. All that extra energy allows for more water to get into that air, and that's why the holding capacity of the air is much higher at the higher temperatures with respect to moisture. Okay? So all has to do with it, everything else. I don't think there's any, many other lines we want to look at except for some coil cooling lines. But let's talk about adding energy and taking energy away. We talked about adding sensible energy. Right, we're going to go in the right direction. Sensible energy is dry energy. Temperature-based energy it is not moisture energy. So we call it sensible heat, and we're going to go from left to right when we add it to a volume of air. So the air in this room, if there were no people in it, there was no moisture-emitting sources, it would just be lights in a grow room without plants or people. If we want to take that away, we go in the opposite direction. If I'm going to cool the air down in a sensible only manner, I'm not taking any moisture away. I don't go in this direction. I don't go in this direction. I don't change the humidity ratio. I don't change the dew point. I'm just changing where I am with respect to dry bulb. I can add moisture directly to a space. Now, this is actually a lot harder than you might think it is to go from the air at this room temperature and humidity to a level straight up on this chart towards the intersection of the dry bulb and the dew point and the wet bulb. It's actually quite hard to do that because as I add moisture into the air, what happens? It gets colder. Why? Because What happens? What happens? What's that? Evaporative cooling. So what does that by, mean? By adding moisture to the air. Okay, so I've added moisture to the air. So what? Um, I think it, it, there's some physical property that, that uh, cools the air. That's exactly right. I mean, that, there's no really better answer than that. A droplet of air, as it evaporates, is absorbing temperature sensible energy from the space. And those water molecules shed off of that droplet until it is all water molecules in air. We call it dry air, okay? So that energy absorption releases the water molecules and now all the, all the molecules in a very homogeneous way have the same amount of energy. That energy, temperature-wise, is lower even though the moisture content has gone up. But if I want to go from here to here, I can do a couple things. I can heat up the water as I'm shooting it into the air. These are what, this is what steam humidifiers do, for the most part. If they did it perfectly, they would add no more heat than was required to take those molecules and turn them from water into vapor. We always end up with some amount of, uh, some huge amount of humidification and a small amount of temperature increase when we talk about steam generating humidifiers. I'm talking about taking kettle elements, putting them in a box, heating up the water to boiling and shooting that steam into a room. 
And that's the effect you're going to have on the room. Very little temperature increase, but a very high humidity increase. Okay? If I want to take moisture away, well, in general, I have to go down in this direction. To go from here to here in a straight line, also, not one of those things that's really physically possible. There's no media on Earth, as far as I know, and there's definitely none available commercially for the work that we do in greenhouses and in indoor grow that will take a room at this condition and just pull moisture straight out of it without affecting the temperature of the air as it's doing it. We may end up taking this air and cooling it or putting it through a desiccant or putting it through any which way. We, can, we may end up here at the end of the day, which is what we do in a lot of our applications, but there's no way to go straight from there to there. Right. But the net effect is, if I take a point on this chart, I apply some processes to it, from where I begin to where I end, these arrows are our cardinal directions as to what that process ended up doing. If I start here and I end up here, I humidified. Even if I went this way and this way or this way and this way and this way, this way doesn't matter. If I start here and I end up here, I dehumidify. If I start here and I end up here, like we do in so many of our grow room applications, we have heated and dehumidified our air. Okay. But to get from here to here, you'll find out we went all the way here and over. Got it? All right. So you can go in any which direction, any combination of directions following these lines. Cooling and dehumidifying is the one that typically most mechanical air conditioning systems do, not including desk and systems. So what happens when we remove sensible heat? We see that the temperature goes down. Well, let's say that we're cooling the air by introducing it to a surface that's colder than the dew point. Well, we're going to end up cooling the air in a way that cools it below the temperature at which condensation will form. The condensation forms on that surface that we're cooling it with, and then we end up doing some sensible and then latent cooling as well. We'll end up going in this direction. What does that look like in an actual space? Why do we need to do that with an air conditioning system? Well, let's talk about a grow room. We're going to take air from an air conditioning system and put it into a grow. The supply air comes from our air conditioning unit. It falls into the room and spins around and is mixed inside the room. That air is going to pick up the sensible heat from, for example, the lights, the motors, the fans spinning inside the room to mix the air around. This is all dry, sensible energy introduction to that air. But it's also going to pick up latent heat. Again, this is not the same type of dry temperature heat. It's moisture heat. That moisture comes from the plants. The plants are transpiring constantly. Now there is an equilibrium you're going to get if you want to make sure that the room temperature stays the same, and we'll talk about how we get there later. But basically, supply air in will pick up sensible heat and latent heat and be returned back to the air conditioner so we can do something to it. All right? So if we can't match the amount of sensible heat and latent heat added to the air as it passes through a room, we're going to end up unable to control our room conditions. So we need to be able to remove both sensible and latent heat to ensure that we don't stray away from that condition that's going to provide the plant with its maximum vitality. So how do we do that? A couple ways to think about it. The way that we were taught was you have a bucket. I'm heating up that bucket, and I need to balance the water I'm putting into that bucket to maintain a certain temperature. As I remove some of that hot water, as it all mixes inside that bucket, what is the fraction of cool, fresh water I need to bring in to keep the temperature of the bucket exactly where I want it? So I've got a bucket at a certain temperature. I light a fire underneath it. It's getting too hot. OK, I'm going to add some more cool water. I'm going to balance the flow of cool water and the temperature of that water so I can maintain the temperature of the bucket I want, okay? The way that engineers use to talk about the balance 
of both sensible energy removal and latent energy removal is called the sensible heat ratio. Is by picking apart the total amount of energy we take out of the air in both forms and saying what fraction of that is done on the temperature side versus the latent side. So I put air into a room and it goes up 10 degrees Fahrenheit on my dry bulb and it goes up 15 grains per pound on my sensible heat ratio. I'm going to put those numbers into a common unit. I'm going to take that common unit, add it together, and knowing what I know from the temperature in to the room, the temperature leaving the room of that air, I'm going to take that sensible heat gain and divide it by the total heat gain going through that space. Now, these numbers here, the sensible heat gain and the latent heat gain, are dictated by equations called the sensible and latent heat equations. We're not going to go over those right now. The fact of the matter is, there is a way that we can take both types of energy addition and make them into the same common unit. And in doing so, we can come up with a ratio of how much of the energy we have to remove is sensible and how much is latent. So let's talk about that. You're going to look at your chart and you're going to notice that there is this sensible heat ratio around the outside, around the outside, around the outside. It is all referenced to an index point. That index point, you'll find a little dot in the middle here. Where's that dot, Jesse? Give me the temperature and the wet bulb of that dot. The dry bulb and wet bulb temperatures of that dot. Booyah. Mm -hmm. Where are we looking? Are we looking at the wet bulb chart right here in the green? Take this dot and follow the green line all the way over to the uh, wet bulb line. 65. Oh yeah. My bad. Got it? Brian, you yeah. get that? I got it. You know how we got there? I do. All right. Fantastic. All right, what's the relative humidity there, Brian? It's 50. God, you're good. It's 50. All right, let me see, make sure. One, two, three, four, 50. Jesse, is it 50 percent relative humidity? Yes. Yeah? Mike? It is. Amen. We got it. Okay, if I take a volume of air and do something to it, and I end up from going from this point to some other point here, the angle between those two points can be lined up with an angle between our index point and a sensible heat ratio. That's why we have this chart. I don't need to know necessarily what the ratio is going into the thing. I can look at a process and say, hey, we start here and we end up here. Well, what percentage of the energy being added is sensibly based and what it is latently based? How much is sensible and how much is latent? I can use this chart by taking the two points and the angle between them and then corresponding them to whoop, this index point and the angle it forms with this indices on the outside, and that'll tell me how much sensible energy is added or taken away, how much latent energy is added or taken away. Let's talk about some of the more interesting things here. Okay? If I have, if I have, Guns. all right, so, If I have some amount of temperature being taken away that is 100% sensible and zero latent, what is my sensible heat ratio? Okay, so I'm gonna start at this point right here. And I'm gonna go in a sensible direction. I'm gonna take away sensible energy right here. I'm gonna go directly in the leftward direction. Okay? What angle am I making with the indices? It's flat. And if I correlate that to my sensible heat ratio number here, 
It's a one. Okay? You're going to hear the sensible heat ratio term get thrown around a lot. And it's not a term we use every single day. It's, it's almost like a, I wouldn't say it's a relic, but it's, it's definitely not terms that we use in the HVAC industry every day. And you're more prone to hear vapor pressure deficit, which is a much more complex term than sensible heat ratio. But if you really want to know what your air conditioners are doing, you could take a temperature and humidity sensor at two points and go, oh, this is how much sensible energy is being taken out versus how much water energy is being taken out, how much latent energy is being taken out. The steeper I go, the smaller the number gets. Okay? So if I start here and I go here at the end of my process, I've got a very small sensible heat ratio. Why is that? Well, it turns out that going in this direction, from here down, it corresponds to 0.15 or 0.2 on the sensible heat ratio. That means of the energy that's been removed going in this direction, a small fraction of it, 15% or 20% of it, is temperature, and the rest is humidity. 80% is humidity re re removal, right? It is very hard, and the numbers get very small very quick. It is very hard and takes a lot of energy to take water out of air. Okay, that should be the takeaway here. So, my sensible heat ratio climbs up quickly. Anytime you get below 0.8 or 0.75 in this direction, you've basically moved outside of comfort cooling and the world that we live in in commercial air conditioning. Okay, now we start getting into greenhouse stuff and indoor grows. All right, steep curves, that's what we're looking for. We want to take a lot of water away, um, and most likely not a lot of temperature. So it's a, it'd be a lower sensible heat ratio. Absolutely. All the equipment that we're looking at. That's correct. Okay. So we're going to talk about how to get there. You can, you can follow this line. There's an interesting thing about this. I know if I, if I also happen to calculate this many lights in the room and this much water coming out of the room. I can also determine how much my sensible heat ratio has to be for me to adequately keep this space at the right temperature. Basically, I know the ratio. I can take the point I'm trying to maintain and draw a line at this rate away from it as I'm taking energy away from this point. And as I do it, the further I get the less of the air I need to process in the room to maintain this condition. Okay, I could take all the air in this room and I want to make it, I want to keep it at 70 degrees, whatever it is in here, and 50% relative humidity. If I blast air through this room like a tornado and I take away just a little bit of energy with each passing second, I'm just going to change the temperature and the humidity of the air a small fraction before I reintroduce it back in. I don't need, I don't need to make much temperature or humidity change to the space. If all I did was put a tiny tube and suck a little bit of air out, condition it and then send it back in, well I would need to make that air very cold and very dry to get rid of all the heat and the humidity that's being generated in the space. So think about what the implications are for our greenhouses. Plants love consistent temperatures. If I take small tubes of highly conditioned air and drop very cold air into the room at different spots, before the air gets a chance to mix, there will be a microclimate created everywhere I drop that cold air in. And just like whoever is complaining at the reception desk because it's so cold and why can't we adjust the thermostat, right? If I create that drop of air, cold air dropping onto the plant, that plant is gonna suffer. What I'd rather do instead is keep the air coming in as close to the room temperature as possible. And this is the reason in commercial air conditioning, we do four, three, five air changes per hour, which is how many times I take the air in the room and pass it through an air conditioning system in an hour. In ag, so we do this kind of cooling 
and delivery of air in commercial comfort air conditioning systems. We do this in grows. Okay? We're going to move 20 to 30 times the air 20 or 30 times in an hour. We're going to change it out and replace it with conditioned air. Now I say replaced, it's just the same air being cycled back. We're going to take CO2 laden air, we're not going to bring in outside air and replace it. It's the same air. We're going to take it out, condition it, and send it back in. And the conditions that we send it back in at have better be close to the room condition so that we don't cause those microclimates wherever we're dropping the air back out of space. Okay? Does that intuitively make sense anyways? It's a, it, you know, it's a concept you kind of need to like maybe think about it for a while, but I can either send in very cold air and a small amount of it in different spots, or I can move a lot of air and not send it back in at a temperature that is so far from where it started from. Right? So is that why having independent standalone dehumidifiers in the grow room isn't the best strategy? Well, there's a number of reasons for that, and they have to do with compressor dynamics and the heat of, you know, the heat of uh, compressor, co compression of refrigerant gases and where you go with that, all that excess energy. Um, that's one of those reasons that, yeah, definitely you don't want the pockets of hot air sitting around the greenhouse or inside your uh, ag space. There's so many more reasons than that. Hot air comes out of the dehumidifier, it floats. That hot air that's been cooled, so that's been heated and dehumidified is hot and it's staying up there unless you have another fan to blow it down. So now instead of having just my dehumidifier, I've got a dehumidifier and I've got a fan. That fan has to blow it down, has to do it in a distributed way. That's where if you hit it, hit that hot air straight down, yeah, you're going to have a problem where one plant is probably at an ideal condition and right beside it the other plant's not, right? That plant is very highly stressed and is prone to pathogen, uh, you know, pathogen development for the most part. Okay, temperature, all different types of humidity. Densities of air changing as we go hot and cold. We're talking about how we, how we process air now, okay? How we change temperatures. Cooling, heating, humidification, dehumidification, okay? If I was at any other starting point, and I knew my sensible latent balance, I could go to my new starting point using the ratio line that I drew, the 60%, the 0.6 sensible heat ratio, translate it up and know that I had to deliver air somewhere along this line here to counteract the energy balance in my room. This is a well-engineered room, I know exactly what the lights are doing, where the moisture is coming from, everything else. I can use this line to tell me, boy, I need to deliver air here and a little bit of it, or I need to deliver air here and a lot of it. Okay? Here's the tricky part. I don't cool air in straight lines that follow the sensible humidity ratio. Instead, I cool air by going through 4 inch to 12 inch cooling coils. The cooling coil is a big metal box with fins, and I'm passing through those fins a coil of chilled water or boiling refrigerant. That makes the fins very cold. My air comes through, and as it's coming through, let's say I was at this point, as I put air through a cooling coil, the radiator on your car, except with cold stuff in it. As the air passes through the cooling coil, we start to drop temperature very quickly. But we don't drop humidity. That air hasn't gotten to the saturation point yet. We haven't got to that wet bulb temperature. As I get to the wet bulb temperature, the moisture starts to fall out as I approach it. I don't have to hit it, but as I approach it. And as it starts to fall out, I can get colder and colder and colder. And now, now my sensible heat, heat ratio has been met. But I wanted air on this line and I wanted this air here, but I had to go all the way here to get it, and then heat it back up sensibly. 
So I determined that I need this point of air and this amount of air changes through a room. I can't get from here to here directly. I have to cool the air first and then heat it back up. My friends, this is brute force dehumidification. When we say brute force dehumidification, I am using a source of cold, which is very hard to generate, and I'm gonna cool my air well past the temperature I need it to be, right? I only need, I only need air right here. I only need air at 65, 68 degrees. But I need it at a humidity ratio of 60. Well, to get from here, which is 70, down to here, which is 68 degrees Fahrenheit and 60 grains per pound, I have to go all the way down, cool that air down to 52 degrees, and then reheat it all the way back up to 60. This is illegal if we're using new forms of energy to do that reheating. So in the industry, what we do is we use a compressor to compress refrigerants. The heat of that compression is used to drive the reheating effect. We needed the compressors to run anyways because we had to get them to expand refrigerant gases to make the cold surface on the coil to dehumidify it in the first place. We're not really wasting all that much energy, but we are using a lot of energy going from this point to this point because my compressor is responsible for going all the way down here, making the air all the way this cold and then reheating it back up. The reheating is free as far as we're concerned. We were gonna run the compressors anyways to dry it out. It's not like we're adding toasters in the Airstream or electric resistance heaters. We're not adding natural gas burners. We're just using the compressor energy we were gonna send to the environment anyways. Cool? The reheat is free, but the cooling is not. And not only that, the design of refrigerant systems means that I can basically only reheat to about 10 degrees below what my starting condition was. Traditional reheat systems just don't make the air any hotter. But there are conditions we'll talk about in later parts of this video series that will show you we need to go not just to 68 degrees, not to 75, we have to get to 85, maybe even 90 degrees if we want to keep the room at the same temperature, the same VVD, the same everything that we're trying to maintain so the plants have a consistent environment and the maximum vitality.